Trust Union. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you tonight's emergency debate, which will be on the motion, this house would bow to baby George. Opening the proposition, we have a first year law student from King's, Sachin Parathinglam. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the proposition today is going to argue that we here should bow to our Prince George, baby George, as it is being said. Now, before we go on to this, the motion says that this house would bow down to Prince George. In effect, this is looking at making a choice. We can bow to him if we want to, but we don't have to if we don't want to. And the fact of the matter is, I am going to argue that we should, based or we would rather, based on the fact that Prince George represents the monarchy. And as a component of the monarchy, we have to remember that as individuals, we directly benefit from certain aspects of the monarchy. Therefore, by bowing to Prince George, we are acknowledging this benefit. It is not about elitism, neither is this creating a culture of subservience. This is simply acknowledging the basic benefits the monarchy accrues to this country. First of all, let's take the economic argument. It is indisputable that the royal wedding brought in millions and millions and millions of pounds to Great Britain in tourism. Sure, there was about a seven million bill in terms of taxation for security, but the fact of the matter is, economically, much more money was brought in than it was spent. Secondly, the fact is, the monarchy, the tourism it creates, the multifaceted nature of the monarchy means that tourism and income is brought to the country in a variety of ways. I mean, for example, the royal wedding, the jubilee, hundreds of thousands of dollars are generated each year through just random restaurant events, parties, things that are acknowledging the fact that we have this monarchy and benefiting from the fact that tourism bring, uh, the tourism that uh, comes along with being a part of the monarchy and endorsing the monarchy. Secondly, the monarchy creates undoubtedly this feeling of community, the royal wedding, the jubilee. Everyone unites irregardless of parties and beliefs. It transcends politics, creates a British identity and unifies everyone based on the fact that there is no politics involved and everyone be, be, will be able to unite based on the idea of inclusivity and oneness. So the fact is that the monarchy and enjoying and be, the fact that the monarchy exists is testimony to the fact that in Britain, we have psychological benefits from the monarchy. We're happy when the royal wedding is, takes place. We're happy when Prince George is born. It's a fun thing. It's exciting for all of us. And the fact of the matter is bowing to Prince George is simply an acknowledgement that this benefit exists and nothing more than that. Now, the opposition will probably argue that this is pre a creation of an aristocratic kind of state in the sense that bowing to Prince George is basically acknowledging our subservience to the monarchy, creating a kind or rather affirming the bygone kind of idea of imperialism, which does not fit with the modern state that we are in today. But the fact of the matter is, firstly, that is, that is forgetting the fact that the monarchy represents an institution, not an individual. If someone foreign asks someone who is British, why do you have a constitutional monarchy? Why do you have a queen? It's ridiculous. And the most logical answer is the queen is a ceremonial position. She does not hold any institutional power. So the fact of the matter is, by bowing to this individual, we are forgetting the fact that the individual is really a representation of the institution. And we have by choice endorsed this institution. No one is forcing Britain to have a monarchy. The fact of the matter is we can get rid of the monarchy if we so wish because political pressure is such that the monarchy is dependent on the people. It is not some immune body. It is directly derived from the fact that we allow it to occur by the fact that we acknowledge that there are more benefits from having the monarchy than not having the monarchy. On top of all of that, I would like to say that the other, uh, the, the, fact, the fact of the matter is that by having the monarchy, this debate, this house would bow to Prince George, is a question, is a choice between having the monarchy and acknowledging that it does accrues, the, the people of Britain accrue certain benefits from having it and not having the monarchy. On top of all of that, let's just take the practical interpretation of this topic. This house would bow to Prince George. I mean, he is a baby. If Prince, if Will and Kate brought Prince George down in a pram, I mean, you kind of have to bow down to speak to him. I mean, he is quite small. I mean, really. I mean, obviously, you would have to do that to speak to him. That's a practical reality of the fact that he is a tiny kid. And on top of all of that, we also have to remember that the idea of bowing to Prince George, the idea of acknowledging that he is a part of the monarchy, the idea of acknowledging that he is indeed um, a representative of the institution of the state. I mean, 
if someone bows to Prince George, for example, let's say I bow to Prince George, it's not that I consider myself subservient to Prince George, it's just that, well, it'd be quite nice for me to bow to him, maybe someone could take a picture, and then 30 years on, I've got a picture with the King of England. I mean, what? why wouldn't I do that? The fact of the matter is that we are taking this far too seriously and interpreting this topic in take, putting, taking the ambit of this topic into an area which really, really, really is dangerous in the sense that it does not allow us to recognize the benefits of the monarchy. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, but I hope I have argued and I hope I have managed to convince you that this debate is a choice between pro-monarchy and anti-monarchy. If you want to accept and you want to enjoy the benefits that the monarchy endows, please agree with us. And if you do not, you're happy to agree with the opposition. And well, we'll see what happens then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sachin. Now, the first speaker in opposition is a second year English student from Christ College, Jilly Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand the appeal of the sweet, nostalgic smell of tradition. I'll admit, I get a little lightheaded when I put my gown on. I enjoy the Latin grace at dinner and I like a little bit of pomp and ceremony as much as the next guy. The thing with Cambridge traditions is that they are largely harmless. Charming, even. Uh, a remnant from an older, more softly bigoted age in which the consumption of large amounts of alcohol at 19 was enough to guarantee you a ministerial position at 50. <laughs> However, there are some traditions that are not harmless and I submit to you that bowing to a member of the royal family, any member of the royal family, is one of them. The monarchy is not harmless, it's not benign. They have a huge and clandestine amount of influence on British society. For those in doubt of this, I submit this extract from an article published in The Guardian in July this year. Judges have ruled that the public has no right to read documents that would reveal how Prince Charles has sought to alter government policies. Three High Court judges have rejected a legal attempt by The Guardian to force the publication of private letters written by the Prince to government ministers. Cabinet ministers conceded that the Prince's private letters contained Charles's most deeply held personal views and beliefs, which could undermine the perception of his political neutrality. The briefest of Google searches exposes the pastel union jack of soft-hearted monarchism to be hollow. These people are not your friends. They're not looking out for you. They're not just like us. Nope. The idea that they protect democracy by their neutrality is clearly erroneous. They deserve your derision, not your submission. And that's what bowing is, ultimately. It's a sign of respect and deference. When you bow to someone, you submit to them. The basis of this submission in the case of the royal family is that they... Well, do we bow to Prince Philip for his work towards racial equality? Uh, do we bow to Harry for his ability not to get naked in Vegas hotel rooms and be photographed? No, not even the Queen is submitted to because of what she has done, admirable as some of that may be, but because of who she is. No one would dream of suggesting that we all start bowing to Bono, except maybe Bono himself, but his charity work is considerable. The idea that one human being should submit herself to another because the other was born into a higher social position is deeply offensive to me. I mean, why not roll this out across society at large and I'll curtsy to everyone whose daddy earns more than mine. Bowing to someone suggests that they are worthy of respect. I don't respect baby George more than I respect any other human being. Why would I? He has done nothing to deserve my respect except be born into a life of incredible privilege. The sole basis for bowing to him is the fact that he is, by accident of birth, a member of the royal family. I mean, like, let's be honest about this, if he'd fired out of anybody else's downstairs, he would maybe make his own father's iPhone background, but certainly not the pages of Hello. <laughs> that we're even mooting this proposition is, a result of some, is the result of something of a propaganda coup. It is essentially the upper middle class equivalent of being Honey Boo Boo's mother. The idea that any adult would bow to a child is simply ridiculous. I mean, I refer, of course, to the Wills and Kate brand. I mean, they're cute, they're bland, they've got shiny hair, and we've got distracted. 
Is it not terrible in a democracy to say that we know off the bat who our next three heads of state will be? Is that truly a representation of the best of British values, of fairness and equality and democracy? Our next head of state will be another overprivileged white dude who was born into his job, and I'm not interested in being represented on a global stage by another overprivileged white dude. The monarchy reinforced at the highest level that it's not actually the case that we live in an equal society. Our figurehead will never be black, he'll never be Jewish, he'll never be Chinese, he'll never be Muslim, Sikh, Catholic, like he'll never even be from Sheffield. <laughs> and that's not what I want from my head of state, not when there are heads of state as cool as Mary McAleese and Nelson Mandela out there. Be jealous, Cambridge. Want more from your head of state than the erroneous perception of harmlessness. Want someone that you can actually respect because of what they've done rather than a misplaced sense of social inferiority. The monarchy represents an old-fashioned, class-driven UK that thinks hereditary privilege is enough. It's not. And if it was, I wouldn't be addressing the Cambridge Union. You'd be listening to some boring, posh bloke rather than a fabulous Irish woman. <laughs> it's not enough, and we cannot seriously consider ourselves a democracy if we expect one human to bow to another on the basis of what family they're from. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jilly. Now, as is customary, I will open the floor to two rounds of floor speeches uh, in proposition, opposition, and abstention of the motion. Is there anybody who would like to make a one-minute speech in proposition? <coughs> yes, sir. Have to give you this. Richard Parkins, Trinity College. Mr. President, I'm getting a little bit fed up with hearing the litany of undemocratic. What's so great about democracy? <laughs> Adolf Hitler was elected democratically. So was Joseph Stalin. So was Robert Mugabe. There is nothing virtuous or wonderful about democracy. It's simply the fact that most other systems of government that we've so far been able to devise seem to work less well. Just remember that when somebody says, I'm democratic! Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, would anyone like to make a speech in opposition? I'm, I'm, I must be blind. Here we go. Yes, thank you. Hello, Ben Taylor, Homerton College. Um, we've heard that we should bow down to baby George because he is a benefit to our country and a benefit to our society. And I just ask, why then do we not bow down to, say, nurses, teachers and social workers without whom this country would suffer a lot worse than if we didn't have the monarchy itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone like to make a speech in abstention? Yes, I think I saw you first. Oh, I'm Adali, Fitzwilliam College. It's more of a point against and for, so altogether it's kind of zero. Um, <coughs> so if we, if we do appreciate the monarchy, assuming we do, then you know, this is a culture where bowing is non-existent as a sign of respect at all. Why would we give it to the monarchy? Surely just allowing them to exist. <laughs> Surely allowing them to exist is enough gratitude. Um, and to the point against, it's kind of against more what the speaker said, the Cambridge traditions are kind of harmful. I mean, they make us think we're intelligent and that we're good. When, you know, we're just, I, I feel like generally normal students, so they build up our ego over nothing. Thank you. <laughs> I 
Thank you. Now, I would like to invite one more round of floor speeches. Um, so, could we have one more speech in proposition, please? <laughs> no? If not, we can move on. Am I, am I being blind again? Over there. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Tom Harvey, Queen's College. I'd just like to address the opposition's point that bowing has to be a sign of respect. In most cases, yes, probably it is, but it's just a f form of communication. And the monarchy, you know, they're, they're a bit of fun, but, you know, they're entertaining. And by bowing to baby George, perhaps you're not actually saying, oh, I respect you so much, sir, you tiny little infant child that hasn't really done anything yet. Perhaps you can just be saying, yeah, I'm joining, joining in with this game. It's quite funny, you know, to have this group of entertaining individuals that put a bit of gloss on our culture and society. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Now, could I invite one more speech in opposition? There was one over here. Over there. In the corner, please. I am a very manly man. <laughs> and as a very manly man, I stay away from all things pink, all things fluffy, all things cute. Imagine then when I'm on Facebook and I see pictures of this adorable tiny little infant, George. How do I feel? I feel emasculated. My feeling of self-worth plummets. And I'm sure it's the same for many, many other manly men in this room. And so, for the self-worth and self-confidence and just general all-round image of all men, I think the idea of in any way appreciating a cute little child abhorrent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, no, thank you very much. Um, now, finally, I would like to invite one speech in abstention. Over there, please. Callum Worsley, Emmanuel College. Now, I buy arguments from both sides here. I don't entirely agree with the whole birthright thing, but equally I agree with the gentleman over there that democracy is a slightly overrated thing. But hey, bowing to little kids might be kind of cool, so why don't we try and work this out somehow else? I propose, therefore, a meritocracy. We're the coolest dads in the land, the manliest men, etc., etc. Our good friend over here, for example. I suggest they then participate in whatever kind of combat we so choose, whether that be th throwing objects at one another or, I don't know, I've got that kind of game show gladiators in my head, whatever. We will hold a public vote. We will decide how these guys are going to compete. And basically, the coolest dad will get the, the British public to bow down to their kid because, hey, that might be cool. Why not? Super, thank you very much. And please do come to the union next term for Father Hunger Games. <laughs> um, now, uh, we will now conclude with our second speakers in proposition and opposition. And the second speaker in proposition is going to be Alexander Hardwick, who is a first year classicist from Queens. Thank you. Right now, before I, well, this debate's been a lot about monarchy so far, and I'm, I'm fully with what was said about the monarchy on, of course, proposition side, not so much on opposition side, but I want to make this debate more about, well, about George. But firstly, let me just rebut some of the um, more interesting assertions that have been made against us. I suppose I got the, so I got the impression that the royal family may not be as politically neutral as we think, therefore we should not bow down to them. Are we to assume that George, at sort of a few months old, already has rabidly hardline political views? I assume from your, from your speeches that that is what we should assume. So, right, and then, um, what else? Yes, we have a manly man over there who was emasculated by George. Well, I'm sorry for you, but it happens. I don't know what to say, really. Right, but the floor point that really really swayed me was the one that was made actually by a Queen speaker who pointed out that the royal family can be entertaining 
Yes. And that is the crux of my speech today. So, what does, why? What are my two points? Why should we, why should we bow down to George? If we take this as seeing him as the symbol of, of the royal family and respecting him for that, both of which I think we should do, there are two reasons we should do this. Firstly, because we want to, and because we already do. Take, for instance, the media. And it was only recently that we braved the storm of media attention over the birth of a perfectly healthy, normal baby boy. So, some illustrative headlines. We had the obvious media headline, it's a boy. The repetitive media headline, it's a boy. The awful puns, including Georgius. And, of course, my personal favorite, quote-unquote, oh boy, one's a grandpa. And, which illustrates just how much the media got excited about this birth. And, of course, best of all, the christening nabbed a glorious 16 pages of my favorite publication, the Daily Mail. So, what is this show? Uh, no, thank you. It is my favorite publication. You can't really disagree with that. Sorry. Um, so, what does this tell us? Why is it significant? Why should you listen to someone who thought the pun produced by the sun was actually quite funny? Well, the point is, this is the power exercised by a baby. Without even really realizing it, we have followed George's every move since birth. We could probably guess from interviews with his father, the average volume in decibels of George's voice when he wakes up at night. We, ladies and gentlemen, every time you buy a newspaper with, 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 which describes, talks about what George's been up to, you bow down to him. Because you buy these newspapers, you want to find out about the royal family. You find them entertaining, as the floor speaker said. Uh, no, thank you. And so, because Simply because, if, if nothing else, you already do, and you want to find the royal family entertaining, why not? Why not give in to this? Why not bow down to them if they're so integral to our society that you buy newspapers every day which talk about them? Now, my second point. It has not escaped my notice that the presence of the monarchy has excited some minor controversy in this um, chamber so far. In a nutshell, do we really need the monarchy? And the proposition's answer, obviously, is a resounding yes. And this is supported by the presence of baby George. What's the most obvious thing about George? Hmm. Well, he's a baby. He's immensely cute, okay? Unless the opposition has a heart of stone, which, from what they've said, it seems a reasonable assumption to make, um, I, think, I think they have to concede that. So what? Why is this significant? Well, an immensely cute baby, uh, no thank you, challenges the subconscious perceptions of the monarchy as, as perhaps outdated, slightly archaic. Some people, I can't quite believe it, but... There you go. Some people think the monarchy is irrelevant. Some think the monarchy is archaic. They are wrong. And how can we prove to them they're wrong? Well, a baby, the ultimate relatable image, the ultimate society-friendly image, simply imagine a future in which George is playing with baubles in the corner of the Queen's Christmas message. Imagine that. Doesn't that make the monarchy the ultimate relatable, family-friendly group. And so, if we follow what the first proposition speaker said, and I think you should, if you respect the monarchy for what they've done for us, then we also use George to prove to us just how relatable they are. And so, to draw my speech to a close, I can see the card is tapping at me. Think about Harry Potter, please, if you will. Think about the power that can be wielded by a very young child. And if you... If... If you see no connection between the boy who lived and the boy who's just been born, well, let me tell you, think of the power he wields over the media, the power he wields over our hearts and spirits to buy these newspapers, and the power George wields over our perceptions of the monarchy, making it far more relatable and far more positive. So for these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I implore you to support the proposition today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Now, to close the case for the opposition, I would like to invite Alex Porter, who is a third year PPS student from Murray Edwards. Hi, um, I'd like to thank the last speaker on the proposition for bringing this debate back to what it's actually about, which is this house would bow to baby George. Not this house supports the monarchy, which um, I personally don't, but 
this isn't just about the institution of the monarchy, it's about the specific act of bowing to Prince George, which I will argue discuss and upsets me for several reasons. Um, I, I think it was important that um, the last speaker brought up the issue of the media frenzy surrounding um, baby George, and I'd like to contrast his favourite publication with my own. Um, while his favourite publication dedicated 16 pages to what Kate Middleton was wearing and um, other various minutiae about the ceremony, my favourite newspaper, The Independent, said, baby got christened. I, that, that was literally their headline, it was a box about that big. Um, and I think that very well sums up how I feel about this issue. For every minute we spend worrying about Prince George, for every page of news that is dedicated to his christening, there are thousands of children, thousands of people being ignored, thousands of people whose stories are not as important as George's by virtue of not being born into the incredible privilege to which he is party. Um, yes, I'll cede. I'll come to that, actually. Um, the reason that it disgusts me on such a profound level, especially at this moment in time, is because of the incredibly hard times so many people in this country are facing. And I think, you know, the monarchy is great. It is a, it's a bit of fun. It stops us having to worry about the fact that lots of things are very, very wrong with this country at the moment. One of those being institutionalised class privilege. Um, and I think that the the deference to the monarchy on this issue is particularly worrying and disturbing. Um, so I, I would say that the, the monarchy is held up as a symbol that is completely antithetical to meritocracy. Um, and I'd like to come to the point that um, the proposition, the first speaker on the proposition argued that the monarchy doesn't have any real power. Um, and that seems to be an important part of political power, um, which I would argue is complete nonsense, of course they do. Um, if you didn't see the Evening Standard over the summer published a thousand most powerful Londoners and Prince George was number one. I mean, just because he can't run for office, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have incredible social power and um, if he is ever monarch, incredible political power as well. How many, how many of us have the privilege just of, by virtue of being born to have 20 minutes with the Prime Minister every week? I, I, I don't think I will, so... Um, I think that's quite important to think about how much political and social power he had compared to other people such as David Cameron, Mark Carney, you know, people that weren't born a month ago. Um, and I think the, the last point that we've, um, the, the proposition, uh, the opposition would like to make is um, of rebuttal is in response, the monarchy does good. The monarchy brings good to this country, but the monarchy can only bring good due to the incredibly privileged position it's in. Um, the, we've had a lot of discussions, I feel, in Cambridge recently about privileging speech and, you know, Prince Charles gets to set the agenda on architecture, on the environment, by virtue of nothing, by virtue of being born. And I find this very distressing and, um, and I think that this is a problem. Like, they might, they might do good, but they do good from a position that they have no right to decide the agenda on. I, the last speaker mentioned that, um, you know, we, we have a problem with Prince George because we don't know what his, you know, why, why would we have a problem? He's not political. Of course he's political. I mean, given his, given his family history, what do we reckon his political views are going to be? They're obviously going to be to continue with the status quo because the status quo is doing pretty well for him. So I think if we're against the status quo, if we have issues with the way society is at the moment with the way class is so institutionalized i if, if you have any belief that there we're lacking in equality in society at the moment i think it's completely antithetical to bow to prince george thank you very much thank you very much alex now to decide this motion that this house would bow to baby george we have to fall back on the highly scientific method of voting by acclamation, um, whereby those in favour shout aye, those against shout no, and presumably those who abstain remain silent. Um, so, could those in favour of the proposition 
that this house would bow to baby George, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say no. No! <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> Actually... No, but my trouble is, like, the abstentions would just be silent, wouldn't they? <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, do you want to shout maybe? Shout maybe. Okay. <laughs> the opposition have it. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a wonderful audience. I do hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you.